Okay, everybody. Hi. Um, it is seven o'clock, so we are going to go ahead and get started with all the preliminary stuff. Um, so, um, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Michelle Winters. I'm the executive director of the Alliance for Housing Solutions. We're a nonprofit organization focused on housing issues in Arlington and Northern Virginia. Um, Public education events like tonight are a major part of our mission. And so we're pleased uh, to be co-hosting this event tonight with the Housing Arlington team in the Community Planning, Housing and Development Department of the County. Uh, we have a lot of people registered for tonight, over 220 people registered. So it is uh, gonna be a busy night. Um, and I wanna introduce, or I wanna talk about a few uh, details, logistical things before I introduce the speakers though. Um, first off, we have uh, collected a large number of questions through the registration form, um, and all uh, all of those that were that have arrived by this morning have been provided by, um, to the county staff in advance so that they can provide answers um, following their presentation tonight. We will also be accepting live written questions through the Q and A box um, and on Zoom. So this is uh, not through Facebook. If you're on Facebook and you want to ask a question. There's plenty of room over on Zoom. Just go ahead and, and register and join over there. Um, the chat box is not where the questions will be posted though. Use the Q&A box um, for, for the questions so that they fall into the right place. Um, you'll also be able to hit a thumbs up on uh, questions to help us prioritize the ones um, that we're gonna be able to try to get to tonight with such a large uh, group. We will be alternating between the questions that were pre-submitted and the questions that come in live tonight. Um, but because there's such a large number of questions already, we know we won't have time to address them all. Um, so the county staff have committed to responding to all the questions in writing um, after the event um, and as this process moves forward. So um, also after the event, AHS and the county will be posting the video and the slides along with that Q&A uh, and those responses when, when they become available. So I would like to now introduce our speakers for tonight. Um, we have Kelly Brown, who is a Comprehensive Planning Section Supervisor uh, for Arlington. We have Russell Denau Schroeder, who is Principal Planner with the Housing Division. Richard Tucker, who is the Housing Arlington Coordinator, is also here to help address questions. And then we have some students, uh, our former students from Virginia Tech, um, Maddie Youngren, Owen James, Maggie Cooper, and Alex Wilkerson are all here. Um, they were involved in the, the research report and you'll be hearing more about that as part of their Master of Urban and Regional Planning program. So very excited to hear what everybody has to say and I'm gonna turn it over to Kelly. All right, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, we are very happy to be able to share with you tonight highlights from the Missing Middle Research Compendium. Our presentation will cover background on this study, uh, as well as an overview of the research compendium. Uh, we'll also touch on um, key highlights from the, uh, the research compendium. Uh, we will then turn it over to the Virginia Tech students to share findings from their report that they uh, worked on over the course of last semester. And then we will move into uh, a Q&A session. So first, um, I'll talk a little bit about the background of the missing middle housing study. So by way of background, the Missing Middle Housing Study is one of many projects under the Housing Arlington Initiative. Uh, housing Arlington was established in 2019 to address housing affordability issues, find strategies to increase supply, and also increase housing choice. As you can see, there have been numerous events leading to where we are today. Um, numerous uh, events, programs, and projects are underway, um, just to name a few. Um, there was an amendment in 2019 to expand flexibility to build accessory dwellings. Um, there are also initiatives to support condominiums. Um, there was an amendment to the zoning ordinance in 2019 as well to support construction of elder care facilities. Um, and there is policy development work underway for the housing conservation districts, which are areas in the county where we are seeking to preserve and promote market rate affordable housing.
So um, speaking now more specifically about missing middle housing, what is missing middle housing when we talk about it? Uh, well, missing middle housing is um, housing types that are in the middle between single family detached houses and mid to high rise apartment buildings. It is a reference to size, not price. Um, used in this context, middle references um, also its relative location on a spectrum of housing types, as you can see in this image. So examples include duplexes, triplexes, courtyard apartments, townhomes, and more. Uh, the cost of these housing types vary based on style, size, location, and market forces. And again, missing middle housing types do not always correlate with a specific income bracket, although they may be built more affordable than a single family detached home or what would otherwise be produced. Um, so missing middle housing, um, you may see it um, in your neighborhood. It's, it's actually already here today in Arlington. Um, it presents itself in a variety of different typologies, again represented in um, a form such as a duplex, which can be side by side, um, stacked one on top of each other as a triplex, as an accessory dwelling or carriage house, townhome, a fourplex, uh, courtyard apartments, townhomes, and um, there are even some sixplexes. And there are benefits to missing middle housing types. Um, they serve as an alternative form to single family detached homes and uh, high rise development. So it's a, a transition between those two areas. It's a, a very, um, walk, it supports walkability. It's um, conducive to um, a pedestrian scale and it appeals to a broader range of residents. Um, a cross section of our community, growing families, young adults, older adults, um, and more. Um, and it is not a new thing. Um, much of the missing middle housing that you see in Arlington was built long ago, and that is the case across the country. You find it in many of our uh, older cities, and again, it really represents those housing types in the middle between single family detached homes and uh, more denser housing types. They were built before modern zoner, modern, excuse me, modern zoning standards were introduced, uh, restricting their development um, in our current day. So um, the challenge, however, is that um, although we do have a supply of missing middle housing in Arlington, this supply of missing middle housing is limited in quantity and it's shrinking. So looking at small apartment buildings that may be considered a missing middle typology, um, it, those exist in, in somewhat greater supply, but they do not provide family sized units. So the goals of this study are, um, are two. First, to increase housing supply, and secondly, to increase the diversity of housing choice and housing types. And there are several outcomes we hope to seek, we, we are seeking through this study. First, in, our, in the first part of our process that we're hoping to kick off this fall, we want to establish a shared understanding in the community of our problem. We're also looking um, to develop through that community process options for county board consideration moving forward. And then ultimately policy and regulatory changes to enable new housing types um, in locations that are um, determined appropriate throughout the county and also identification of issues for further study. And planning is just getting started. We are at the very beginning of our process. The, uh, work done so far has been to develop a community engagement plan, uh, really ground our process in um, an equity framework to further the county's diverse and inclusive vision. Uh, we've been conducting a great deal of research, which is why we're here tonight to share uh, key findings from our research so far. And then as we move into the process, conduct evaluation, evaluation with the community of um, choices that we may want to consider looking at new housing types and where they might be appropriate. Um, as, as I said before, we're just getting started. Um, so this timeline shows us that um, we've been in a, a pre-planning phase now for about a year, um, developing our research compendium, developing a scope of work, sharing that with the community, getting feedback on it. Um, we will be um, sharing that uh, scope of work with the county board uh, for their um, uh, discussion and um, a green light to move forward for a study kickoff this fall. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the very first part of our process is to um, work, we call it phase one, and it's to build a common understanding. What are the issues we face? What are our community priorities? 
and then um, based on those com community priorities, what are housing types that we may want to consider um, for future study and what are the issues we need to be thinking about as we study these housing types. Um, we will develop a report for the county board based on what we hear from the community on their preferences and their issues and concerns and uh, opportunities, uh, what they view as opportunities, and that will allow us to make some recommendations to the county board for housing types to study um, in a more focused manner um, as a phase two, um, looking to summer of next year. In phase two, we will uh, be studying specifically what the, these housing types should look like, um, how they should be designed, how they should be situated on our lots, how we can support um, it, it, tree preservation, uh, uh, augmenting our tree canopy, um, as well as things like transfer, the transportation network and so on. Um, we will share these findings with the community and then use that feedback to develop another report for the county board uh, with recommendations for um, implementation. And by that, I mean um, zoning warrants amendments and um, other um, future studies, such as uh, general land use plan amendments or studies that can um, support the recommendations in the study about new housing types and where they should be uh, developed. So uh, with that, I'm now going to um, launch into uh, um, an overview of our research compendium. Um, the research compendium, as I mentioned before, is an element, uh, was a, a key component or element of the pre-planning for the study launch. Um, it's really an existing conditions report um, and it um, was developed to serve as a baseline or starting point for the community discussion about missing middle housing challenges, opportunities, and issues moving forward. This is something we do for all of our planning processes, and we were glad to be able to issue these findings over the course of the summer um, as something of a summer reading program to really um, establish, again, that baseline um, of understanding to kick off the community process. So the research compendium was issued over the course of this summer um, as five um, bulletins. Um, the bulletins each focus on a central topic and can function as standalone reports or viewed um, together as, as one um, compendium of information. Um, the research compendium um, is um, something that can be viewed as a document that you can go through page by page and really pull out um, a great deal of statistics and interesting facts that you might not be aware of. Um, but there's also several key takeaways that we would like to highlight through this study. And um, that's what I will move into now. So um, bulletin one was the first bulletin that we um, issued. Um, earlier this summer, and it really is um, serves as a stakeholder guide to the study. So it um, presents an overview of Housing Arlington. It also talks about, um, excuse me, um, having a hard time seeing my screen. It, it talks about the, the missing middle housing study overview, um, as well as the phases of the study. It talks about um, case study examples, so places where a missing middle is um, being considered in other communities throughout the country. Um, it provides an overview of the full compendium and then key highlights of, of the, full, the, the full set of five bulletins. And um, now with that, I'm actually going to turn it over to my colleague, Russell Schroeder from the Housing Division, and he's going to share some of the key highlights from Bulletin 2 and Bulletin 3. Thank you, Kelly. Um, moving on. Next slide. All right, so Bulletin 2 really um, attempts to describe the current housing market. Um, we look at the uh, projections and forecasts that the Council of Government uh, recently uh, approved, as well as uh, looking more closely at our own housing inventory, both what we have and what's being built and looking at, at home sales. Uh, next slide. So this slide, uh, Bulletin 2, explores uh, the types and amounts of housing that exists today. Uh, we have almost 90,000 garden, mid-rise, and high-rise multifamily units, apartments and condos, and over 25,000 single-family detached homes. But uh, very little, uh, if you look at the, the bars for duplex and townhomes, uh, that, that's uh, rather scant supply compared to the two kind of 
larger bars on, on the left and right. Next. From 2010 through the end of 2019, Arlington produced approximately 11,370 housing units net of any demolitions, or on an average of 1,137 housing units a year. Uh, the overwhelming majority of these homes have been mid to high rise apartments. This accounts for 91% of the net new housing production in the county. Uh, this apartment growth is primarily concentrated in the three planning corridors in Arlington, the Roslyn Ballston corridor, the Richmond Highway corridor, and the Columbia Pike corridor. And only 9% of the net increase in housing was an ownership stock. This is an increase of 5% were townhomes, 3% were condos, and 1% was single family detached. Again, this is when you account for the demolitions taking place as well. So the net increase in single family detached housing was only uh, 106 units for the entire decade. The chart on the right uh, depicts the gross housing built. Or, or that is to say that it doesn't subtract out the demolitions. Uh, it shows the housing by bedroom size along with the corresponding housing types. And I apologize that the colors on these two graphs don't align with each other. Uh, but it demonstrates that the most uh, of our development has been geared towards uh, smaller units, predominantly one and two bedrooms, and most of these rental. Uh, almost all of the single family detached construction during this period was four bedrooms or larger. And next slide. So bulletin two also deals with, uh, presents some data regarding teardowns. Um, uh, we, we know that most our, our single family areas are, are built out and that, uh, that uh, you know, teardowns, uh, they've accounted for 8% of, of, of the single family housing stock between uh, 2010 and 2019. One moment. Um, but uh, from 2009 to 2019, 1,245 single family detached homes were torn down and replaced with newer, larger houses. So that's the, the gross volume that we have. Uh, 1,029 additional single family detached homes were substantially renovated over the same period. The teardowns and substantial re renovations accounted for 8% of single family housing stock over the 10 year period. Um, and you can see from this map that, that it's really throughout the county overall we, we, where this activity is taking place. Okay, next. So digging a little deeper into the teardown data, uh, homes demolished had an average of 1,515 square feet. Uh, and the replacement homes that were built in their wake had an average of more than three times that size or averaging 4,750 square feet with an average price of $1.7 million. Uh, at one time, uh, let's call it the year 2000, uh, three bedroom houses made up the largest share of single family detached market. Uh, and so as we see smaller homes being replaced by much larger homes, the landscape of the housing market is shifting has shifted with fewer smaller homes available in the market and an ever-growing share of larger homes dominating the single-family detached market. Why is this important? Um, the do-nothing or status quo scenario, uh, it doesn't mean that neighborhoods will stay the same and that, or that we will preserve existing modest homes. Uh, we should expect if we do nothing that the same uh, rate of production and change will, will continue in the neighborhoods with producing significantly larger and more uh, expensive homes. Next. So this set of maps um, shows where a household could afford to rent a home in Arlington based on median rent by neighborhood or census tract actually, and the household median income by race. So the map on the left shows where a median income black or African-American household could afford to live. And moving to the right, it's uh, where, where a Hispanic or Latino household uh, could afford to live, uh, followed by where Asian households could afford to live. And on the far right, uh, it, 
depicts where a median income white household could afford to live. And there's uh, a large disparity between the map on the left and the map on the right. Um, some have contended uh, that this is a result of income inequality between racial and ethnic groups, and that's a valid point. But it also highlights that the availability of housing opportunities is a significant barrier in the way of achieving a truly inclusive community. Bulletin three. The bulletin three, we've attempted to uh, explore somewhat the existing uh, missing middle housing types in Arlington. I know it seems funny that we're using the term missing when, when, when there's many present in, in our community. Um, but it, the next slide uh, shows, shows a map here where we see that uh, the various housing types uh, are indeed uh, found in many areas throughout the county. Um, it's important to recognize that these types of housing already exist and have existed in our community, but the zoning in most of the county prohibits these types of housing. While single family housing makes up about 25% of housing, uh, single family homes consume 75% of the land that is zoned for residential uses. And I'd like to give the microphone back to Kelly. Kelly, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you. So um, bulletin four um, addresses Arlington's land use policy and zoning um, at a high level and also going into great detail as well. So um, this bulletin looks at the history of Arlington's land use and zoning. It also um, talks about where we are today in terms of our land use and zoning policy and framework. Um, it specifically talks about um, the general land use plan, so our county's land use vision, um, the um, specific zoning regulations for um, single uh, missing middle housing types, and it also talks about um, impacts on housing development. So specifically single family detached housing, um, the stack duplex model, side-by-side -side duplex, um, the townhouse and the small multiplex. So in reviewing the history of Arlington zoning, we can observe how the rules for housing types actually evolved over time. So over the course of the 20th century, rules for missing middle housing types like stacked and side-by-side -side duplexes and small apartment buildings evolved and became more and more restrictive. These changes to the rules in terms of um, the lot size, um, lot width, and setback requirements made it more difficult to build these housing types and also made older homes become non-conforming to these new rules, making it harder for these uh, homes to make reinvestment without having to get special approval from the Board of Zoning Appeals. Um, in addition, these changes also affected how these housing types could be built with changes from a by right use to a special exception use that required county board approval. And then finally, um, and, uh, something very not notable um, to point out is that row houses were restricted for many years and the zoning ordinance pre prevented them from being built in Arlington. And so this is where we are today. Uh, we can see how Arlington zoning standards, which are based on historical zoning decisions, result in a, um, a very large buildable area. Um, you can also see from these images that a single family detached home, um, you um, can build up to a certain height, um, certain setbacks, um, and uh, really build out um, a majority of your, your lot area. Um, in contrast, duplexes and side-by-sides, they actually have um, uh, more restrictive setback requirements, thus making it harder to build um, new duplexes, even where they're currently um, uh, designated as appropriate on the, the general land use plan. Um, and we also look at um, the general land use plan as a policy document and um, what it has meant for um, the ability to build housing over time. So um, the zoning ordinance is only one element of our land use framework. The general land use plan sets forth our future vision. And the map on the left is the county's very first club adopted in 1961. 
it aligns with uh, the underlying zoning districts that were um, in place at the time. So thus this first general land use plan did not set forth a new vision for the county, but really just adopted as policy um, the existing zoning framework that was quite exclusionary in that only certain um, single family uh, development was really what was allowed in the majority of the county, except for a few places where you could build multifamily or duplexes. And um, if you compare this map from the 1960s to the map on the right, the 2020 general land use plan, uh, you can see that there's, there's actually been, there has been change uh, in terms of what's allowed in the corridors, um, allowing for a greater density proximate to transit, but the majority of the county has stayed the same, um, envisioning primarily single family development in the majority of the county. Um, something that happened between 1961 and 2020 was something um, actually in the 1970s, there was something adopted called the development and growth goals for the, the county. And that is what directed development around the metro line in exchange for leaving the rest of the county untouched. So that is what brings us to where we are today. Development allowed on the corridors, but really restricted in the majority of the county. And so that brings us to where we are today. The general land use plan allows us to build uh, primarily single family development in the majority of the county and uh, what can be built uh, because of the high cost of land and our um, zoning ordinance allowing um, large single family homes, that's what you get. You get um, the, the, the demolition of small homes um, for very large single family detached homes. Um, you also get very large townhouses and you, you get large duplexes uh, because even though they have more restrictive um, setbacks, the, the size of the lot for a, a duplex is much larger than what was permitted historically. So because of the way the zoning warrants changed over time to require larger and larger lots, that's why you see larger and larger housing type, housing products being built in the current day. And so not only um, in terms of impacts, does our, our zoning and land use framework provide for, for really only the construction of large units, given the housing market that we are in today. Uh, when one overlays the single family detached zoning and the majority of the county with the share of white population, in the county, one can see that there's a significant overlap between single family detached zoning and areas of majority white population. So this, this really begs the question of whether single family detached zoning supports the county's vision for diversity and inclusion. If the majority of the county only allows for single family housing, we must ask this question, how can the county's land use policy better support the county's vision? And then this finally brings us to Bulletin 5. Uh, bulletin 5 was the last bulletin issued, and it talks about miss, the missing middle housing study in the context of um, all of the other um, policy um, that undergirds uh, planning and growth in, our, in Arlington, Arlington's comprehensive plan. So Arlington's comprehensive plan um, uh, is made up of 11 elements. Um, policy areas that are addressed in this guide include energy, historic preservation, parks, parking, schools, stormwater, transportation, and trees. And it reviews, the bulletin reviews existing policies, data, and recent actions in each of these policy areas. So some of the key findings from bulletin five are that um, housing and land use planning are, are actually just two factors that contribute to the livability, vibrancy, and success of Arlington. Um, so, as I said before, the comprehensive plan includes 11 elements that guides future development in Arlington. And it's together all of these, 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 these uh, plans um, that support um, our residential growth. Um, in addition to the comprehensive plan, it's uh, Bulletin 5 also uh, introduces um, something that, uh, that Arlington recently um, uh, adopted called a, a racial equity framework, realizing Arlington's commitment to equity. And um, this builds on existing efforts but seeks to further work in equity in the areas of digital access, excuse me, 
housing and public health and seeks to make equity a basic consideration in all we do. And so again, together, um, all of these policy areas and plans um, seek to support residential growth and development, as well as will support the missing middle housing study moving forward to um, really help realize the overall vision for Arlington. So with that, I'm now going to pass the presentation over to Maddie and Owen with, and the um, rest of the students with the Virginia Tech research team. Awesome. Sorry. Next slide, please. Thanks, Kelly. Um, so my name is Maddie Youngren, and you'll hear from Owen James in a bit. Um, but we are alumni from Virginia Tech's Masters of Urban and Regional Planning program. Um, so Virginia Tech assembled this report in support of Arlington County's missing middle housing research. Um, it's the culmination of a semester long capstone uh, studio course in which graduate students examined um, the history of planning and zoning in the county and its relationship to patterns of residential development and the county population. Um, the full report is available publicly with the rest of Arlington's Missing Middle Housing Study Research Compendium, um, and we'll share a few highlights tonight. Um, next slide, please. Um, Arlington County's first zoning ordinance in 1930 uh, codified the county's existing land use, uh, permitting um, single-family detached dwellings in existing single-family neighborhoods and multifamily dwellings in existing areas of multifamily development. A critical exception to this alignment between the new zoning ordinance and existing land use occurred in several African-American neighborhoods, for example, Green Valley, um, formerly known as Knock which were zoned as residential A, yet included multifamily dwellings, making the existing multifamily dwellings non-conforming. This chart here um, shows the evolution of residential zoning districts through the first three zoning ordinances. Um, note in 1938, you can see the row house ban reflected in this chart, which would continue for decades. The 1942 zoning ordinance and map beyond adding complexity to the residential zoning districts expanded areas in the county available for higher density residential development, for example, in Fairlington. Next slide, please. Um, in the early 20th century, uh, restrictive covenants were prevalent in Arlington County, um, contributing to patterns of racial segregation. And Alcova Heights, Bluemont, Glebewood Village, Monroe Courts, and Westover all had some variation of restrictive covenants that prohibited home sales to African Americans and other racial groups. The 1948 Supreme Court decision, Shelley versus Kramer, a decision that made these covenants unenforceable, and the adoption of the 1968 Fair Housing Act, which more broadly banned housing discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, or national origin, are actions that have curtailed discriminatory practices, um, but however, patterns of segregation still exist today. Arlington experienced intense population growth and corresponding increases in the need for housing due to the war efforts in the 1940s. And the county was also largely built out by the time Arlington adopted its first general land use plan, or GLUP, in 1961. While the GLUP was to be the primary policy guide for future development in the county, given the extent to which the county was developed at the time of its publication, the initial GLUP focused on conservation of the existing suburban residential character, that is, largely single family residential pattern of development. And now I'll pass it on to Owen. Thanks, Mary. Uh, so in the second half of the 20th century, uh, Arlington had a couple major changes to its uh, zoning and land use laws. Um, one was the repeal of the row house ban, which we've uh, mentioned a couple times, which led to a, a small little boomlet uh, in row house development. And the other one was, of course, the coming to the metro um, and uh, the consequent decision to uh, locate the route uh, further south and to uh, develop a, a strategy of transit oriented development. Uh, and through the uh, bullseye strategy, um, planners at the time decided to concentrate uh, high density development uh, in the areas directly around um, the station footprints, uh, but left most of the other uh, housing, even, the, even that housing that's uh, pretty close to the stations, uh, largely untouched. 
Um, so that's what you see right there, less than 10% of uh, single family zone land was converted to mixed use or high density. Uh, another change during this time period was uh, a Virginia law that allowed um, the conversion of rental stock into condos. Um, this pushed out a lot of people who uh, were previously renting in uh, middle, uh, middle density housing um, and could not afford to purchase the houses. Uh, next slide, please. And just to bring it back to where we are today, uh, similar to the points that have been brought up earlier, um, the county you know, was uh, built out as far as single family homes uh, go in uh, the 1960s. Uh, the county's not getting any bigger, so you can see that hasn't really grown at all. Uh, but uh, especially starting in the 1980s, uh, uh, the number of units built in uh, big apartment buildings, uh, in this case, uh, buildings with 10 units or more, uh, really took off. Um, there's a little bit of growth uh, you can see in the row houses uh, with the repeal of the row house ban, um, but not a whole lot of growth uh, of that middle density housing. Um, and so that has brought us to where we are today, where there is uh, still a substantial amount of single family zone land and uh, units, and then uh, a lot of construction and uh, uh, stock of high density apartment building units. Um, with that, I'll turn it back over to uh, the county for a Q&A session. Okay, great. So um, before we uh, launch into the Q&A session, just wanted to touch on next steps in our process. Uh, so again, we're still in um, a pre-planning phase of our study. Um, we are um, hoping to kick off the study this fall. Um, there are some dates you can put on your calendar. There is going to be a county board work session on September 22nd at 3 p.m. Uh, where we um, will be sharing this scope of work with the county board. Um, it is a scope of work that will incorporate feedback that we received from the community over the course of this year and um, a, re a recommendation to launch the study in the fall. Uh, we're hoping to kick off the study in October and uh, stay tuned for dates about kickoff events and engagement opportunities. Um, and so uh, please thank you again for participating tonight, attending this session. Uh, we appreciate your interest. Um, please continue to stay involved um, and stay informed. Um, you can find us on our webpage. Um, you can also sign up to become a community partner, uh, subscribe for study updates, and, and also learn more about other Housing Arlington initiatives. So as I mentioned at the beginning, and as Michelle mentioned as well, attendees were able to submit questions in advance. So we're gonna begin the Q&A in answering some of those questions first that we've already received, and then we'll take breaks throughout the live Q&A to answer additional questions that were posed in advance. Um, certainly we're not gonna to get to all the questions tonight, but we will post all the questions and answers following this event. So I'm going to actually pass it over to Richard Tucker, our, our Housing Arlington Coordinator, to kick off the Q&A. Uh, good evening, everyone. I uh, want to jump right in and, and start to answer some of these uh, questions. And again, as, as Kelly mentioned, uh, we did, uh, we have tried to answer some quick answers, give some quick answers in the chat. Uh, I see some, some Q&A uh, piling up, so we'll have to move quickly, I think, to see how much we can get through. Uh, so the first question we received online prior to the meeting was, you know, why, why did we, uh, why was the research compendium released during the summer, during the pandemic, uh, without public engagement or uh, opportunity to give input about topics, et cetera, uh, and before the scope was, was finalized. So uh, it's in keeping with our usual practice for any of our large uh, planning processes to um, uh, develop data or in information prior to uh, any study. And so if you look over the years, uh, any of our sector plans, um, you can see on those web pages still, there's something called a briefing book, which is similar to what we've done here. We've sort of broken it out differently in this case, instead of issuing a 150, 200 page document at the start of the process, we sort of let it out slowly over time, uh, understanding that it's a lot to absorb and we wanted to encourage people to, to really dig in and read it. Um, we did delay this whole process. This was a process that was uh, slated to start in spring, but because of the pandemic, we did pull back. Uh, and for a time, uh, during March through May or June, there was no communication coming from the county other than COVID-related responses. Uh, so uh, during the summer, 
a number of the uh, uh, commissions and advisory boards started to meet. So we thought it was appropriate at that time to start the process of the review of the document. This is our document. This is information we wanted to provide to the community so that we could start with a, a common understanding of, of the basis of the problem. And we've uh, sort of outlined that in, in the document, uh, as well as policy and other things that people kind of need to know as we start the process. And that's the purpose of, of issuing it. Um, why, uh, why is, second question, why is the program being hosted in conjunction with the Alliance since this group has a clear bias regarding the missing middle housing study? I'm gonna answer this question in the next one as well. Were any other organizations or individuals who applied to be community partners invited to co-host. So um, first answer is um, the Alliance has, during the, the, the run up to this and even before the process started, has been in, interested in, in this topic and they've hosted meetings and pushed out information. Uh, while the compendium was being released, they were pushing that out as well. Uh, we had always intended to do a meeting like tonight uh, to wrap up the compendium and, 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 and bring focus to the compendium and take some Q&A. Uh, they, we found out that they were also going to do a similar meeting. So given the fact that we can't tell them not to do a meeting, it's their choice as to whether they're going to meet or not. We thought we, it'd be better to, to team up with them so that there would be one meeting uh, and so that there would be no confusion. Uh, other organizations have uh, requested to become community partners. Uh, we haven't uh, responded to those folks. We, we intend to as the process kicks off. We intend to get in touch with them, tell them how they can participate, what their roles and responsibilities are, how we can work with them to make sure that our message is getting out to the broader community. And I'll take this opportunity to invite everyone um, to, to become a community partner. If you can be sort of a bridge between us and the broader community, your group that you may be a part of, your civic association, uh, that would be helpful. So because we don't have the resources to go to everyone's meeting. Uh, a lot of the information is going to be uh, pushed out other than the meetings that we're going to plan through our community partners. Um, uh, a question, why is this study being conducted if it will not result in affordable housing? Um, what we've said is that the goals of the study are to increase housing supply uh, and increase the diversity of housing. And we think those are important goals. Uh, uh, there may be a focus and some people are concerned and, and, and hope that this will result in, in housing that is affordable to certain income groups. Uh, that may be a, a further outcome uh, beyond this study, but what we're trying to do is identify these housing types, where they might be appropriate, uh, what they might look like, and as part of this study, we will examine you know, what they might sell for, uh, and if there's a further evaluation after that point uh, to develop uh, more affordability or reach a certain income group, that could be an outgrowth of this process, but that's not specifically uh, a part of this process. Last question, and I'm going to uh, address at this point, uh, why aren't we working to address the, the, the income gap as a best way to address the ever widening gaps in housing prices at the upper and lower ends? Um, I think the way this is worded uh, uh, suggests that there is that we would pay people to live in Arlington. Uh, people of some means, not low income folks, but people who could afford, afford more housing. I'm not sure that there's a policy anywhere in the country where that occurs. Um, uh, and, and, and so what we, what we want to do uh, is really look from a land use perspective. Are there tools that we can use that can encourage the housing that might be more affordable than what we're seeing being built currently, these teardown situations where uh, modestly size homes are being replaced by very large homes that are going for you know over a million dollars up to two million dollars or more uh, so we're, we're trying to increase housing supply uh, and, and address this from a land use perspective as opposed to a, a money you know a providing money to to individuals by the way i want to me mention i know this question has come up in some other conversations that i've had with citizens uh, the county policy currently uh, we have uh, funds available that we assist low income housing development. Uh, and that is targeted to people at 60% of median and below. Uh, typically these are, these are rental uh, housing opportunities. Um, since there are limited financial resources, uh, any money that we would devote to this purpose to uh, 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 decrease this uh, affordability gap for uh, market, rate afford market rate housing, I think there's a, you know, a challenge there of diverting money that would be available to the lowest income folks 
to to achieve this goal. And I, from a policy standpoint, that's just not what the, the county is geared towards. Uh, we could have further discussion about that, but that is not currently the county's policy. I'll stop there. I think we're going to take some of the questions that are in the chat. I think we're up yes. to. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Richard. Um, sure. So we're going to go one page of Q and A um, from the PowerPoint, um, and then we're going to do some from the live session. And so people have been um, helpfully, um, you know, um, upvoting some things here to bring things to the top. And so I'll just go with the one that is all the way at the top, which is uh, from Jim. Has Arlington County considered constraining um, house square footage by law? And who would you like to answer that? Um, that is an open question to all of you. I'll take it. Um, there, there is nothing in place at this time to do that. Um, I think we may examine that as part of this study as we determine, you know, how um, these uh, missing middle housing types might hit the market and what they would, might sell for as compared to um, large single family homes. There may be some uh, thought to uh, addressing that particular issue. Okay. Any other answers on that? No? Okay. Uh, so the next question is from Jane. Do we have analysis that indicates the amount of density needed within a walkable area to support local small scale businesses? Yeah, uh, I can take that one, unless Richard, you wanted to jump in. No, okay, great, Kelly. Kelly. Okay, so um, this is a great question because it really um, gets to some of the benefits of missing middle housing that Missing middle housing is a good thing for a range of reasons. Um, missing middle housing is part of a community fab. It, it was always uh, historically a part of a community's fabric. Um, you know, having um, uh, an apartment over a storefront, um, and just over time, as we're learning from what happened in Arlington, um, the zoning became more and more restrictive, and these housing types became not conforming or impossible to build. But um, it, uh, missing middle housing types do support a walkable community and they do uh, support demand for small scale businesses. So um, if you do a Google search um, for this to answer this type of question, um, you can find that it takes about 1500 units um, to support one block of stores. Um, so um, not necessarily saying that, that missing middle housing is going to uh, prop up the, the local economy, but it is part of, it is, one, it is a tool in our toolbox to create a, a, a vibrant community and a place where people want to spend time uh, rather than walking along a street with um, buildings that aren't necessarily, uh, teardowns that aren't necessarily of a human scale. Great, thanks Kelly. Um, the next question is uh, from Maria. If more density is built, how will the need for increased school seats be addressed? We know there is no land. Yeah, I, I can take that one too. So um, part of this study is going to be um, looking at the housing types, the what, and then the where, and then um, I, trying to get an assessment of, of what that would mean in terms of new growth. And we will be working with um, our partners within the, the, the county and other departments, as well as our partners in EPS, uh, to make sure that they can use this information for their planning. Um, but it's just really important to emphasize that due to the health of the regional economy, Arlington is going to continue to be seen as a desirable place to live. And we've been seeing that over the course of several years as our single family neighborhoods uh, change. Um, you know, new families are moving in. They are, they are the ones tearing down the homes and rebuilding them larger, um, building families that are, that are, um, that are um, creating a vibrant um, uh, school district in Arlington. And so this, this demand for housing will continue to place upward pressure on land values and really only has the potential to abate if we plan for additional growth. So um, conducting this study is a way to plan for and manage this growth. And it's understood that capital investment will be needed to support residential growth. And um, many of these investments are already planned as I, um, was trying to explain and, and sharing the information about the comprehensive plan. The county is, is not only looking at 
the need to support growth in schools, but also um, looking at how to address stormwater through flood resilient Arlington. Um, there will be updates to the natural resource management plan and the urban forestry master plan. The county is now a biophilic city network partner looking at ways to continue to green our community. Um, there's also the master transportation plan that's regularly updated. The residential permit parking program is currently under review. Um, so there's just um, definitely um, a need to plan for growth and we're working on many fronts to make that happen. Thanks, Kelly. I think we should go back to the next uh, page of questions on your slides if you'd like to flip forward, forward one. Sure. Okay. Um, so I will go ahead and uh, address these questions. Some of them I think I've already, um, we've already tackled. Um, but one thing I wanted to note, the questions that, that Richard answered and also the questions that um, we organized on this slide are, we kind of view them as big picture questions, questions more about um, the what and the why. Um, so we also are looking forward to answering um, questions that are, that are um, more technical or data related um, in the research compendium as well. Um, but just to jump right in here, um, actually, um, just as I said, um, we had received this question already. It's, it's a common question. Why conduct this study before the county makes needed improvements to existing infrastructure and services? Um, new housing types could exacerbate problems with aging infrastructure and services that are over capacity. So the county um, is aware that uh, we are an aging, aging community and investment is needed. And, and so that planning is already underway and this study will make additional recommendations for how to plan uh, for growth to support, um, support the, the findings and recommendations of this study. Uh, the next question that we received um, that was like a big picture question, uh, it was actually at uh, first a comment, the need for GLUP changes and new zoning in many parts of the county is obvious. How will the process work step by step with some specific examples, including timelines? So I wanted to put this in here just to acknowledge that we received it. Um, I hope that the information in the presentation tonight was useful to give you a sense of what is going to be happening moving forward um, in terms of the process. Uh, when we get to the implementation phase, which is where we're going to be recommending specific zoning ordinance amendments, general land use plan amendments, um, we don't know yet what those strat what that what those recommendations will look like because we don't know yet um, what housing types will be recommended and where they'll be appropriate. Um, the county has been learning from some other jurisdictions that have already started to adopt missing middle uh, housing regulations. This is, Arlington won't be the first ones to do this. It's becoming um, a known um, need throughout the county, throughout the country. Um, so there are communities like Grand Rapids, Michigan, um, that actually 10 years ago introduced uh, regulations to support missing middle housing. Um, and then uh, certainly it's been in the news recently that Portland uh, adopted a suite of measures to support missing middle housing types. So um, we're learning uh, from those, those regulations as, the, as um, we become aware of them and uh, encourage uh, you if you're interested to, to Google uh, those communities and, and, and learn for yourself. Uh, third question, so where in the county are solutions being exam examined? In the more affluent far north or only along metro lines? Um, so this is a good question. Um, it, we will be looking, this, this study is a county-wide um, effort. So we'll be looking at the entire county. Um, but the, the first step is to figure out the what. So what are the housing types? that um, align with the county's priorities. Um, and then once we know the what, um, then we'll figure out the where. So housing, a, high, a housing typology like a duplex is appropriate in some places where um, a, a, a small multiplex or a, in other words, a low density of, um, apartment building is not. And so those are the types of questions we'll be answering in the study. Um, and then finally, describe the relative impact of past discrimination as opposed to the current high cost of land in denying current housing opportunities to households of color. And then as a follow on, is this denial of opportunity for households of color due to gentrification by profitable development? So um, this is another really great question. And 
um, wanted to take care in answering it, that um, just to, to really um, start to um, raise awareness about um, the understanding that Arlington's land use framework is the result of decisions of the past that um, have produced development patterns that limit housing variety and supply. These decisions reinforced uh, race and class-based segregation and inequities that we still experience today. So looking to the future, Arlington could choose to do nothing to address um, the limitations on the production of new and diverse housing types. Um, but what that means is that the structural barriers and institutional racism embedded in the county's land use policy would remain. And um, given regional housing pressures, teardowns and the redevelopment of single family detached houses would continue and land values would continue to increase. So in that kind of a scenario, Arlington's vision to be a diverse and inclusive community would become impossible to attain. And it would be harder and harder for households of diverse socioeconomic and demographic makeup to find housing in Arlington. So it's just important to acknowledge that across all of our institutions, um, much work must be done to create a more equitable and inclusive community while also addressing rising housing costs. And so conducting a single housing study is one of many deliberate choices that the county can make to correct the mistakes of the past and pave a new path for the future of Arlington. So um, I think with that, we can go back to the live Q&A. Okay, uh, thanks Kelly. So the, the top question right now um, is from Benjamin. Um, how much does the split between buy right construction for single family housing and site plan requirements for multifamily contribute to the lack of, of single family housing? I think he means middle, missing middle housing, but um, we'll talk, you know, do what you can to answer the question. Will that be addressed in the recommendations to the board? So uh, I'll jump in here. Um, and I'm not sure that there's a, a, a split between by right construction for single family homes and site plan uh, requirements for multifamily. I'm not sure what's meant by that. Uh, in the single family zones currently, the only thing that can be built is a single family home. So there isn't really the option to build a multifamily uh, project in a single family neighborhood by site plan. Um, but what uh, this alludes to what we talked about in bulletin two, basically what we are getting, there's only two types of development going on, which is uh, large concrete and steel, which is very expensive to build buildings, which result in expensive rentals and uh, very large single family homes replacing more modest single family homes, which again are, are pricing uh, folks out of, out of the, the neighborhood. So I'm not sure what recommendation um, uh, he's speaking to here. Okay. Um, the next question is from Rick. Um, how do inflexible zoning standards in quotes um, result in loss of smaller single family homes? So this is related to the last question. The, um, because uh, you can only build a single family home to replace a single family home in a single family zone, that's all you get. And the zoning standards don't allow for uh, more, more, more housing types as, such as a duplex, such as a triplex or, or other types that may have more uh, more than more than one unit in it. Um, that rising land costs, the only way to uh, get lower cost housing uh, with rising land costs is to reduce the cost of land per unit, um, which would be something that a missing mid middle housing type would, would be able to achieve. Okay. Um, can I ask a follow up? There was somebody who pointed out um, that they have seen a fourplex uh, go up um, in, in their neighborhood. Um, so um, why is it that that can happen sometimes? I don't know the specifics of that. Maybe Kelly or, or, or Richard have more information. So you're saying that there are situations where you might see a what go up? Sorry, Michelle. Maybe a duplex or a fourplex. So the, the certain, they, they can yeah. be allowed right now. 
So um, in, in single family zoning districts, it is possible to build a duplex, but only uh, by special exception. Like you have to get a use permit or uh, go through a site plan approval to build a duplex. So it's very hard to do that. Um, there's a lot of uh, barriers to that, but if, um, it's, if it's a large enough lot, if it's a developer that um, you know, has enough resources, then, then you may see one getting built. But because, as we mentioned in the presentation, the, the standards in the zoning ordinance require such large lots um, and uh, allow for um, the, the building heights um, of, of 35 feet um, or, um, and the, the setbacks as they are, then you're, and because of the value of the land being so expensive, that's why you're seeing such, such large product just kind of as a, a by the way. Um, if you see a, um, a, a, a multifamily product built today in a single family neighborhood, it's probably a, a, a piece of land that is in a, a that actually has a multifamily residential zoning. So located in an RA district and that, that you do find those in some single family neighborhoods. Um, um, there's there's um, some areas uh, close to Boston, for example, that have that kind of zoning. Um, and then one from Ben, um, how do height limits in existing RA zones contribute to a lack of missing middle housing in those zones? So um, in existing RA zones uh, for buy right development, for multifamily development, I think you can only build up to 35 feet. Um, so that is that is a limitate a limitation on building a multi-family product in an RA zone by right. You can build something through site plan, um, but then you're looking at a, a much denser product than um, a missing middle housing type. Okay, um, and Ben um, has a lot of of questions, and so in order to give some airtime to some other questions, I'm going to skip down to another Ben. Um, does the county have tools to allow denser multifamily homes if they are affordable? Um, Russell, do you want me to handle that? Uh, and well, I can, as far as uh, multifamily, when, when multifamily buildings are being built through site plan, and these are larger, we're not talking about missing middle here, there are bonus density provisions that, that uh, allow for, for greater density when uh, affordable housing is, is provided. So, so that is something that's in the zoning, but it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really get at missing middle housing. Uh, but uh, there are some tools we, we you know, it's possible in, in exploring missing middle that, that that could be part of the conversation as well. Okay, Almost done. And then another question from Anne. Um, what is the maximum total number of two family or multifamily missing middle dwellings you project could be built in Arlington using the same rules that apply to single family detached currently? And then there's some follow-up questions. Which residential neighborhoods make the likeliest candidates? Um, anyone able to answer yeah, that? I, I, sure, I'd be happy to answer that because uh, really, we're, we haven't launched the study yet. We, we, we've uh, put out our kind of existing conditions uh, research compendium. So we don't have a proposal yet on the table as far as uh, allowing duplexes or where they might be. So we, we, we're not even close to answer, answering that question. But that, should that be a, a policy recommendation, we would, we would then begin an analysis of, well, how many places could that be built? And, and what, are the, what are the possible potential numbers? And then what are the likely numbers? Great. Um, OK, I think we can go back to uh, your uh, other slide. Sure. Okay, I'll, I'm up for this. Uh, Wharton Professor John Huntley recently published a study showing Arlington property and land values are so high that duplex ownership will remain beyond the means of a household earning 100% of area median income in all but a few neighborhoods. To incentivize builders, new du duplexes will need to com 
feet on price with new single family homes, which typically start at 1 million and above. Thus, they will be unaffordable to median income earners who can afford to pay no more than 525,000 for housing. Are you aware of the study? Do you agree or disagree with its findings? And yes, we're aware of the study. We've taken a look at it. Um, we disagree with the study on that it's premised on an affordability target that has not been established as part of a missing middle study. However, um, this study does demonstrate that new duplex construction is likely to be considerably less expensive and attainable to a wider pool of prospective home buyers than current single family rebuilds. Um, but you know, the missing middle study has yet to launch again. So we will uh, be looking at that as we go along. Okay, so I'll just give you some microphone feedback. You need to uh, speak up a little bit sometimes. Okay, thanks. Thanks That's a lot, much Michelle. Better. Want to be audible. Okay. Um, <laughs> next, how many housing units are available for low-income households uh, between 30 and 50 percent of median income? So Arlington County has about 8,650 committed affordable units, which are uh, they're income restricted and, and tenants need to, to qualify and based on income to live in them. Of those, uh, there are 1,505 of those affordable apartments that have rent restrictions below 50% of the area median income. Second part of the question is how many committed affordable units are available for families of four or more? And uh, that's difficult. It depends on the family configuration, but I'm going to uh, take that in the direction that we have an answer for, which is that 9% of the county's committed affordable housing apartments are three bedroom units. Um, that's 760 apartments. Over the last five years, 11% of the new committed affordable housing that was built in the county or was added were three bedroom apartments. And by way of comparison, uh, in apartments in general in the county, only 6% of apartments are, are three bedroom apartments. Next, um, if the county has produced almost 3,000 new housing units per year since 2000, and housing prices have only continued to rise, provide what evidence, what is the evidence that more housing will reduce prices? If we just keep attracting people of higher and higher socioeconomic means, won't this just keep pushing price of land even further and risk displacement? So first of all, um, uh, we haven't built 3,000 housing un units a year. The research compendium uh, has a number in there. I think it's a little bit above 1,100. But if you go back from 2000 over the last 20 years, uh, the county has built uh, 25,163 housing units. That comes out to 1,258 housing units per year. That's significantly less than the questioner stated. Um, but housing prices, uh, getting to the, they're, they're subject to the same economic principles of supply and demand. Um, if supply is restricted while demand increases, the result is always higher housing prices. Uh, and concerning displacement, the county has been very active in preserving existing affordable housing. In recent years, the county financed the acquisition of apartments in Westover and Park Sherlington in order to secure permanent affordability. Uh, we also have land use tools in place, such as the Special Affordable Housing Protection District and the Housing Conservation District. And these were developed to prevent, help prevent the displacement of lower income households throughout the county. And I think we can go back to the question feed. Great. Yes, so I have um, a couple more questions uh, that actually came in um, ahead of time that I, I pulled together. You guys have seen these, but they're not on the slides. Um, so I would like to ask a couple of these as well. So um, will the plan to assist Arlington Public Service workers with purchasing affordable housing continue? And I don't know who gets to answer that. Maybe Russell from the Housing Division? Yeah, yeah. as part of Housing Arlington, we, we do have a component that is, is uh, employee housing. Um, the county currently has a live where you work program for, for their employees. Uh, Arlington Public Schools had one in the past. Uh, they don't currently have one. But we're looking through Housing Arlington at ways to uh, further make it possible for, for the employees uh, who work for, for both the county and schools to, to be able to live here. 
And uh, a related question, is the county developing more programs to meet the missing middle or expanding current ones such as MIPAP? Um, I, I think this question, what, what they're, they're meaning by missing middle, uh, they're not talking about the housing form. I think they're talking about middle income households. So I'll answer it that way. Um, uh, for middle income households, no, the county's current uh, housing assistance program, which provide uh, uh, down payment assistance and, and uh, a uh, equity share loan uh, on, on properties is currently for households considered moderate income. That's 80% of the area median income or, or lower and, and uh, that's not being expanded at, at, at present. Okay. Um, and another question from the, uh, the pre-submitted questions, why didn't you include accessory dwellings, triplexes and row houses as missing middle housing like other jurisdictions have? Yeah, I can, I can take that one. Uh, Russell, add on, okay, if I get it wrong. Um, so um, accessory dwellings actually were included. Um, they were, because there's so few of them, they were actually included in the grouping of single family detached homes, which um, you know, may or may not be the right place for them, but just to place it in context, there are only about 60 um, accessory dwellings in Arlington right now. So it's, it's not even a half a percentage of of, um, of our housing types. Um, triplexes are included in um, the, um, I'm trying, I'm blanking small on the category, the small multifamily category, um, because that's actually how they're, um, the only way that they're allowed right now in the zoning ordinance. Um, you can't actually build a triplex. Um, there's no special category for triplexes. Uh, if you want to build a triplex, then that puts you into the regulations and requirements for um, a multifamily development, which is actually one of our challenges and the reason why we don't see triplexes, because those are, um, just as an aside, um, the districts for that type of development are located mostly on our corridors and in our areas with um, exceedingly high land values, so you're really disincentiv disincentivized to build a triplex in those areas. Um, and then row houses are um, included in the townhouse count. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, one more here. Um, the Susan's question, um, can you outline the benefits including energy use of creating new attached denser housing within neighborhoods in which people find attractive, especially for young families? Also the benefits for some older residents who may consider downsizing, but staying in familiar communities. Yeah, so we would, um, we will definitely have a session where we have our staff from DES on our team as part of the conversation who can really speak um, specifically to some of the statistics around energy use, but certainly um, denser housing types, uh, there's a lot of um, energy efficiency associated with um, a, uh, a more compact, efficient um, housing form. Um, on the topic of um, ah, the question disappeared from my screen. Oh, um, I think it was a question about um, missing middle housing types being supportive to um, families wanting to downsize or, or individuals wanting to yes. downsize. Yes. Um, so that that we know is another need in Arlington. Um, uh, family. Uh, Households that are seeking to downsize from um, single family detached homes have a very difficult time finding um, finding um, a way to downsize in Arlington because um, our smaller housing products are going away. Um, they're um, an aging stock and your, your options are, are really to, to move into um, a, a dense um, multifamily product. Um, you know, there's, there's some of those examples in Boston and and, and courthouse. Um, so um, missing middle housing types, that's something that, we'll, that we wanna look at in the study is what are the housing types that can really be built in a way that's accessible and um, supporting of those folks who wanna stay in Arlington in their, in their senior years. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Um, Carl's question is uh, the development in and at the edge of Arlington Forest, notably pushed Latinx and other ethnic families out, mostly to be replaced with younger white families, not that there's anything wrong with younger white families. How can you ensure the same thing won't happen again with more middle level housing? 
think the short answer is we, we can. That, you know, there, there are certain market forces, whatever uh, development is allowed, uh, at, you know, there's a, there's a point where our, our ability to control what happens ends. So we set up the parameters for either single family development or more flexible, more flexibility to, to create other, create other ho housing types. And then the market takes over. Uh, uh, again, we will examine, you know, at what price any of these housing types that might be allowed would be, would, would, would sell for. Uh, so we'd have some idea. Uh, and uh, from there, it's really a, a market uh, driven outcome. But there are communities that um, are putting in place um, as they develop missing metal uh, regulations in their zoning ordinance for missing metal housing that, that place limits on the size of units. Um, if you want to build a fourplex, for example, um, two of those units need to be um, uh, affordable at a certain income bracket. So um, as Richard was saying, in phase one of the study, um, we will be seeking to understand from the community what are the priorities. And if we, um, if we hear from the community that affordability is, is really one of the key considerations in, um, in, in determining what housing types we should be recommending, then we, we need to make sure that we're looking at housing types that, 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 can, um, that could actually generate some affordability. Okay, great. I think we have one more set of um, page of slides with some existing questions or some pre-submitted questions. Yes. Go. So I will. Um, yeah, I try to cover these. Or uh, Russell, you're covering some of these, and I'm covering some. <laughs> yeah, if you can go okay. on to the second one, I, I, uh, I'll come back to the first one. And okay. Okay, so um, these are uh, these are examples of some data questions that we've received on um, spe specific statistics um, and um, case studies in in the uh, research compendium. So these are great questions, and um, we mostly just wanted to acknowledge tonight that we have received these questions. Um, number one, the statistic regarding 43% of the county's land area is covered by impervious services conflicts with other information previously published in county documents and on web pages. Is this information correct? So, um, sorry. So to answer that question, um, again, just acknowledging that we have received that and we're working with the Department of Parks and Recreation and the Department of Environmental Services um, to just to follow up to make sure that our numbers are correct and if necessary, update the bulletin. So we just wanted to, to acknowledge that we'd received that. And then on the last question, um, are there examples of other similarly sized communities where a directed approach to increasing middle income housing stock has been successful? Uh, if so, were these community cities able to maintain the stock over the course of five to 10 years? So um, the reality is that a lot of cities and counties are now facing these, these same issues that Arlington is facing um, in terms of housing affordability and a realization that over time we've restricted the types of housing that could um, allow for more affordability than, um, than a single family detached house. So we're seeing cities and counties starting to take actions related to, to, to housing and providing for more housing options. Um, so I mentioned earlier, um, the communities of Grand Rapids, Michigan and Portland, Oregon have moved to reallow missing middle housing. And so we'll have to see how the changes in those areas play out. Um, it's still kind of early to tell um, what sort of success we'll have. But as we mentioned before, uh, we don't view a do nothing scenario as a good alternative. Um, and then it's also just important to point out, um, have communities and cities been able to maintain missing middle housing stock? So in terms of the cities where new regulations are on the books, we need to see what's going to happen. But um, it, just right here in Arlington, um, a lot of the existing stack duplexes, side by side duplexes um, and small apartment buildings, we, they were built um, almost 100 years ago and, and they are still affordable. So. Um, it's just important to remember that we're thinking about the long term here, um, adding housing diversity and housing supply over the long term 
is is what we're where where we're hoping to be able to make a difference. Going back to the first question, then, uh, how has Arlington, the Arlington population, since two thousand changed regarding white versus non-white populations and populations broken down by percentages in different income quintiles? Um, unfortunately, I don't have this information by quintiles. Uh, it wasn't part of the, the our study, and you need uh, actually to get um, the microdata to do that. But uh, the Arlington population in the year 2000 was 60% white, non-Latino, non-Hispanic Latino, and 40% uh, all others. Um, it, the latest census data from the 2018 American Community Survey, 62% uh, of Arlington's population was white, non-Hispanic, or Latino. Uh, which means that the, the white population is growing at a, at a faster rate than the non-white population. And uh, from taking what the census does offer, as you go up, the higher incomes um, uh, become more and more white. Okay, so you guys done with that slide? Yep. All right. Um, I have um, scrolled down and found some that Richard had indicated he'd like to answer live. So, I changed my mind. I changed my mind. No. Uh, okay. So we're down at a question um, from Thomas Viles. Um, is missing middle inappropriate for the so-called corridors? Well, I think the, the, the thrust of the question is, why can't this missing middle housing be uh, developed in the corridors? Uh, and, and the answer is that higher density development is already called for in the, in the corridors. So this is less economical to the property owners. What we're discussing is less economical to, to the, the property owners in the corridors. So that's why high rise development, mixed use development uh, happens there and it's of a type and, and scale that is much larger. Now, they, there, are, there could be opportunities on the edges of the corridors uh, for missing middle study, uh, uh, missing middle type housing. So that is something that we can, you know, examine. Great. Um, there was another one you said you wanted to answer from Carl about the, um, whether there was any consideration given to a study entitled, how can Arlington best accommodate the 250,000 or so people we already have here. Is there anything more you'd like to say on those topics? I think we've addressed well, that. Well, I think this question, I guess, assumes that we can close the door and, and, and additional growth won't happen. And that's not the case. Um, what we're, we're indicating through some of our analysis uh, and, and is backed up by, you know, work done by COG and all of the other jurisdictions that, that this area, this region will continue to grow due to uh, the attractiveness of the job market and job growth that will happen. So Arlington will continue to grow. And so we need to examine what we do, what we need to do to accommodate that growth. That growth will be happening because of jobs that will be available in Arlington over time uh, and throughout the region. And if I can just add on to that, um, the question I think is um, a good one because um, the way to answer that is um, actually we already have um, that study in place and it's actually a plan, it's called our comprehensive plan. Um, again, our comprehensive plan is what um, supports the 250,000 or so people who already live here and also supports um, other people who want to live here too. And this comprehensive plan is regularly updated um, as independent elements. And um, I just encourage people to, to get engaged and learn more about what those updates are. Um, but if you want a place to start, the Natural Resources Management Plan and the Urban Forestry Master Plan are both in the beginning stages. And I'm sure they would love to have people involved. Great. Okay, uh, scrolling back up to the top, we have um, a question from Daniel. Detached single household homes can still be built uh, um, by right in multifamily apartment zones. Given that, what, if anything, can be done to specifically promote multi-household housing types in RA zones, which are apartment zones, instead of 
just protecting single family homes right next door to Metro. Yeah, so this is a, a very important area of study um, because um, the RA zones are uh, the districts that already um, permit by right um, multifamily development and are located in areas designated on the general land use plan for multifamily development. And the fact of the matter is that the regulations for multifamily development in these districts are um, <laughs> constrain the production of multifamily development by right. And, and two of the biggest problems are that there is a density um, uh, provision, meaning uh, that um, you have to adhere to certain density parameters when you build multifamily housing in these areas. Um, and a lot of times if you're trying to build a multifamily product, you can't meet those density requirements. Um, there's also minimum lot size requirements that um, make it difficult to um, build multifamily development by right in these zones. So um, there's a lot of things that can be done to improve the ability to build multifamily development in our multifamily development zones. I would also add on to that um, uh, regarding the housing conservation districts that the, the, the board uh, adopted in 2017. Um, because the RA districts are multifamily housing districts, uh, and that was the intent of those districts. Uh, the, we were seeing uh, town ho homes being built within the district by right because that's what, what could be done. Um, really de-densifying the, the areas, taking away multifamily housing, uh, which was, was the purpose of, of those districts in the first place. And so uh, the board moved in that instance to, to create this district to, to maintain uh, the multifamily character of that district. Okay, uh, we only have a few minutes left. Um, and people are asking, Russell, if you can talk louder. I think your microphone slips away from your mouth. So, um, and I, I think I would like to um, see if uh, the panelists would like some time at the end for some closing comments. And if not, I, I have a couple more questions here um, that I can get to. Um, so do, would you like to, uh, with three minutes left, would you like to focus on closing comments now? Any things that we haven't addressed or questions that we, you thought would come up but didn't? I want to give a huge shout out, uh, talk louder so people can hear me. I want to give a huge shout out to the Virginia Tech Studio and the awesome work that they did on uh, the report looking at Arlington's residential development history over the last century plus. Um, if you haven't had a chance to read it, uh, beyond what staff has written this, the, the, they were working uh, on their own to kind of unearth our history. And we learned some valuable things from them. Um, the only closing comment I would like to make is that I'm just very appreciative for everybody's in engagement and interest in the study uh, for, acting, uh, for asking such um, uh, productive questions. I think that it, it's really gonna um, benefit the study in the long run to have people involved in this way and um, just encourage you to stay tuned for the details for the housing kickoff. Again, the work session on September 22nd and the kickoff events in October. Up to you, Richard. Oh, I just want to send out a, a shout out to, I see planning commissioners and former planning commissioners who have uh, participated tonight. So I want to send a shout out to them. Uh, and uh, I see that we've gotten through a number of questions, but a number of questions we haven't. So I want to reinforce that we will be uh, capturing all these questions and, re and responding separately on those. Okay, great. Um, and uh, so Virginia Tech folks, would you guys like to say anything? And we, we haven't had any questions specifically to you. So I'll give you guys an opportunity to, to say something at the end here. Like Maddie? Yeah, I think um, we just want to say thanks so much. It's been really great working with you. We've certainly learned from you all as well. Um, and there have been great questions. Um, we'd love to help you uh, follow up with these as well. Yeah, and I'd just like to also thank you. Uh, thank you all. And it was great working with the study. Um, and for anyone else who's interested, uh, the, the history of uh, middle density housing in Arlington is, is really interesting. And, and our report can be a starting point, but also uh, 
doing your own research into uh, the county's history with, uh, you know, row houses, courtyard apartments, um, all, all that sort of building is, is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just add, uh, as an Arlington resident who lives in uh, missing middle housing in a duplex in South Arlington, um, I absolutely loved uh, working on this project and really better understanding why my neighborhood and why the county looks the way that it does and kind of piggybacking a little bit off of what Owen just said, I would really encourage um, fellow Arlingtonians to, to really think about why their neighborhoods look the way that they do. So thank you for this opportunity. Okay, great. Um, and then I will just sign off um, on behalf of AHS. I thank all of you guys for attending and for those of you who are left on, thank you for sticking around for the whole event. Um, I wanna repeat in case you missed it in the beginning that all of the, the video and the, the slides and the uh, Q's and A's, the questions and answers will all be posted um, both on the county's website and AHS's website. Um, and I also want to invite people who are interested. Um, AHS uh, continues to have other public education events. Um, we are having several this fall. I encourage you to go to our website and check them out. Um, and we look forward to seeing many of you guys uh, again on this kind of forum. We enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.